So hello everyone, I am Ahmed. I've been working at Amazon and Facebook for the past four, four to five years, um, working on different projects involving machine learning. And today I'm gonna walk you through about what you need to know and what I've learned in the past few years on building data annotation pipelines. So we're gonna talk about what data annotation pipelines actually means, when do you need it, why do you need it, the different stages you need to go through to build one, and finally touch upon different considerations you need to be aware of while building a data pipeline. In essence, we're gonna talk about golden standard data sets, how to deal with bad day annotations, how to train the annotators by following an objective process. So at the end of the course, there is a mini project where you're gonna apply hands-on what you've learned to your specific domain or problem space. I'm very excited to share this with you. And so let's just start. Okay, so let's begin. So the first thing I wanna talk about is what is actually building a data labeling pipeline? So a data labeling pipeline has several parts. And the, the idea in general is that you will have um, unlabeled data coming in to annotators and then these humans will label the data and once they label the data the data will then be processed by different stages until eventually we will get the final labels so why do we need all of this uh, so let me start by saying that if you are a small company a startup a small team you probably may not need a data labeling pipeline from the beginning, from the start. It is an investment to be made. And as such, you need to justify that investment. Here are a few reasons why you would justify the investment into a data labeling flow or a pipeline. The third thing is you may have already exhausted the pre-trained models. So as a startup or as a big company, uh, usually we start by getting like looking around and researching what are the pre-trained models that we can use to solve a specific task and so we start with these models but sometimes we want to we want to squeeze more performance we want to improve the accuracy we want to improve the different metrics and so at some point these pre-trained models may not be enough the other thing is Sometimes you don't find the pre-trained models online, so you, but you find training data that you could use to train your own model. And even though this is a good starting point, you may exhaust this as well. The third possible reason is solving a novel problem. So if you are solving a new problem, you may not find the pre-trained model, you may not find training data, and as such, you want to build your own process for labeling the data. And finally, and this is what we used in uh, Amazon Alexa, is to build a data flow or a data labeling pipeline to measure models online performance. So we have a model that is doing whatever task, but then we want to measure what is happening online. And by online, I mean at testing time. So for example, you may have an image understanding model that is classifying if an image is offensive or not. So you want a sample from the test data, from the data that the model is running on online, and, and then start to measure the performance. And the, the way to do that is by sampling the data and then labeling it using a manual workforce and measure the accuracy of the model over time. So let's start with the first component. The first component is the golden standard data set. This is a data set that is built by product owners. By product owners, I mean someone who is familiar with the domain space, who can actually label the first batch of data. Usually at this stage, you want to make sure that the data, the golden standard data set is not biased. So you don't want it to be labeled by one single person. You want it to be diversified as much as possible because we will be building upon the golden standard data set later on. And so what is this golden standard data set? It is a big enough data set. Enough depends on your problem space. If your problem space is simple, you may use like something like a hundred labeled samples in the golden standard data set. The more 
complex the, the problem space and the variety of the cases that people need to be aware of, the bigger this data set needs to be. And it contains the ground truth labels. It contains what we think is the right answer to the problem at hand. And finally, this golden standard will be used to judge annotators at different stages of building the pipeline, at training and at testing. And I'm gonna go into detail later. So then let's talk about annotators. These are humans, obviously, who are going to label the data by hand. And depending on the size of your company or the stage you're in, or how critical building a data flow or data pipeline is for your team, it could be an in-house team. You could invest in having full-time or part-time employees just to label data. Alternatively, you could also outsource this task to something like Mechanical Turk or other services. And because these annotators have never seen this task before, they are not subject matter experts, then we need to train them. And the way we're gonna do that is by thinking about the whole data flow pipeline. For example, we're gonna first train the annotators and validate their performance and then use them to test at test time, essentially to label unlabeled data. And because labeling is subjective, we want to move it as much as possible to be an objective task. So we want to build a sustainable process by which we label the data. And the first thing we will need is a guideline document, a document that highlights the process that an annotator should follow when they are labeling new data. And the whole process of training the annotator then boils down to nailing the guideline document. This let's let's go deep into the guideline document. The guideline documents will contain some sample, some examples from the golden standard data set and what the annotator should do in these cases. And we will start with let, let's say a V1 of the guideline document. Then what we do is give the annotator the guideline document, the V1, and another subset of the golden standard, something that was not added to the guideline document, samples that were not added to the guideline documents. And so the annotator is given golden standard, unlabeled data from their point of view, and the guidelines. Then they produce the labels. Finally, we measure the agreement between the golden standard data set, which we know the, the labels of, and the new labels that the annotator has produced. And once we measure the agreement between the gold standard and the annotator's labels, we iterate by changing the description, adding new samples to highlight subtle differences that we want to, to make sure that the annotators are aware of, or we mark this whole process as a success and say, we have trained annotators. They know what to do. Let's touch upon very quickly on the metric. Uh, we could use something like Kappa score to judge how the annotators are performing. But any agreement metric could do, any metric that could measure the agreement between two data sets, uh, essentially in this case, the golden standard and, or a subset of the golden standard to be precise, and the annotators labels. And once we are happy with the agreement, we then could move to the next step. The next step essentially is testing. So now we have trained and validated the performance of the annotators. We want to start using them. We start testing them. And the way to do that is by labeling unlabeled data, data that we don't know the labels for. Essentially, this term, bad day annotations, refer to the fact that humans being humans, they can do mistakes. They could be having a bad day. And essentially, this affects their labeling or their performance. And like we did in the training, although the, there is subtle differences, the golden standard will be used to judge whether or not the performance of the annotator should be trusted on that given day. Remember, all of these annotators have been already trained, so we know that they know the process. It is just that we don't trust their annotations, or essentially it is a good practice to not trust any annotations and try as much as possible to build process to catch mislabeled data. So moving on, we want to start labeling unseen data. So like I said, we send the sample plus a subject of golden standard 
to an odd number of annotators. An odd number of annotators make it easy to judge later on which label should be assigned because it should be assigned to a sample because we can use something as simple as majority voting. Now that we have a good view of the different components, let's talk about the whole process. This is the testing process. So essentially, we want to label this unlabeled data on the bottom left. We augment it with a golden standard subset, something that the annotators have not seen before during training or validation or in the guidelines. We pass it to an odd number of annotators that produce labels. We then measure the agreement between the golden standard and the annotator's label. If there is no strong agreement, then we discard all annotators' labels. This is key. All of their annotators at this of all of their labels at this point in time is considered to be garbage. If there is strong agreement though, we keep the annotators' labels and then we do majority voting for each sample to produce the final labels. So let's talk about a subtle thing. What what happens when you discard an annotator? Remember, we started with an odd number. If we remove one single annotator, then we're, we're left with an even number of anno annotators, meaning that majority voting will break. But this is not very true, because if, if the process of training the annotators was a success, then usually most of the samples, most of the data points in a sample, would have usually the data points will have a strong agreement between the, the annotators on what label to use. Nevertheless, they, there might be a few data points that they didn't agree on what to do with it. So essentially, one solution to the, the problem is to split them, take a few samples and get a subject matter expert to look at them and figure out why they were different from the other data points and either add them to the guidelines or to the golden standard data set and then take another subset or the rest and do another pass through this testing pipeline by using different annotators for example and by doing that or keep iterating on this eventually we'll reach a point where the golden standard and the guidelines capture as much subtleties to allow the annotators to label with confidence and we won't have that many data points that the annotators don't agree on what to do with them. Finally, I want to talk about data set shift. The golden standard is kind of fixed in stone. The guidelines are the same as well, but the testing data is not. Usually we'll see that over time, the data that is fed to the annotators is starting to shift. If this happens, usually people refer to it as data set shift. And the way to combat that is to have a process by which a small subset of the new label data is fed back to the golden standard and is analyzed by a subject matter expert. So this is a similar point to what I was talking about. In some cases, you want to start sample from the data that is the test data, the live data, the online data, you want to sample from this data a tiny bit and get subject matter experts to look at and to analyze, maybe on a quarterly basis or on a yearly basis. And if they see that the data starts to shift, then we need to go back and train, validate, improve the guidelines, add some of them to the golden standard and so on. So for this course, for the project, we want to sketch our own pipeline. Essentially, I want you to build something similar to what I did in the training validation and testing. You can use something like these diagrams were built on draw.io. You can use any other diagram building tool. But the key point is I want you to focus on your own problem space. For example, does it make sense to do majority voting? Does it make sense to have an odd number of annotators? Does it also make sense to have to use Kappa as an agreement? What other metric can you use? So I want you to focus on your own problem space and if not think about the problem space that you are interested in and then sketch these diagrams taking into account these new details. Feel free to move blocks around if they make sense to your own problem space. Feel free to invent new blocks. What other process or steps they need to go through what other details or subtle subtleties that needs to be taken into account if you are tackling your specific problem space. 
and hopefully once you've done that it shouldn't be a big exercise please post if possible post these diagrams below on Skillshare in the project upload section for other students and myself to benefit so thank you for taking the time and I hope this exercise will get you to notice things because when you're doing things by hand you'll start to notice things that may have gone unnoticed when you were just watching me lecturing so please go through this exercise it is useful and see you on the next video so in conclusion we talked about the different components we need to build a data flow or data annotation pipeline we also talked about the different stages or different steps we need to take from training and validation of the annotators of the whole process and the guidelines we're going to use to testing which involves labeling unseen data we also touched upon the fact that data shifts and data points that the annotators don't know what to do with or don't agree on the labels this is another consideration that we need to take into account uh, for example pass it through subject matter experts, add it to the golden standard, improve the guidelines, and so on. So hopefully you'll f you will have found this useful, and hopefully this will help you build more reliable data products involving machine learning or other tools. Also, finally, if possible, if you're seeing this on Skillshare, I would appreciate if you can leave a comment on what you found useful, how I can improve my communication skills. Thank you.